small group but it's a small room so I think it's okay um, for Friday. Today we want to talk a little bit about the libraries and the library collections here at Yale uh, in the middle in the near what's called the Near East Department. Robin will speak more about that and Omar will speak about the situation in Mosul and the effort to revitalize the libraries there. I'll just give a brief introduction. My name is Angela uh, Angela Boscovich, uh, I'm a writer in the field of culture and the arts, and I lived in Iraq for many, many years, and um, have documented some of what happened in the arts in northern Iraq, and particularly with, with the occupation of ISIS. Um, here is the, is the principal library <laughs> for um, uh, the Middle East, for the Near East, as it's called, the Middle East Studies Library, uh, Robin Dodry. Uh, she's an expert in the, um, in the Arabic collections here. She comes from Georgetown University, uh, a, a master's in Arabic studies. And um, before arriving here to Yale, she was the Middle East Studies Librarian at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, she also has an extensive background and a connection to Egypt. <laughs> uh, so she's a specialist in Egyptian art. Um, and he has a great research on the, on the Arabic and Islamic collection here at Yale. Then to my right is Om Muhammad, a historian from, from Mosul. Uh, he founded the website, uh, the global platform that was Mosul Eye. Uh, I think most people probably know about it, but it was an effort to document the city uh, as a first person account under the occupation of ISIS in 2014 and beyond. And now Mosul Eye has, is transforming itself into a collective of activists, young activists, both in, um, in Iraq, in Mosul, in the city, in Nidua, in the province, but also uh, throughout the world, to revitalize the city, to revive uh, the spirit of the city, to in particular rebuild the, the libraries, and revitalize the libraries and its collection. So um, I think they will all discuss uh, their various points. And there is just one uh, funny thing, and I'm sure Robin, she will, she will continue on this point, but there's always the phrase that Cairo writes, Beirut uh -huh. publishes, and Baghdad reads. So Iraq in particular, and the Iraqis have a huge um, esteem for books and libraries. So what happened to Musa and the Minimus libraries is especially traumatic for Iraqis. So I turn over the floor. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you both of you, Angela and Omar, for inviting me today, and thanks to the World Fellow Program for sponsoring this series of talks. So once again, my name is Alex Robert. I let people call me Robin, um, and I'm a librarian for Middle East Studies uh, in uh, Sterling Memorial Library, and I've been here at Yale for six years. And um, I was asked to speak on uh, Arabic and Islamic collections at Yale, past and present, um, and bring this together. I, I, I've drawn upon the work that I've been doing over the last few years on this very topic, but I also found some new stuff to add, so um, I hope that you'll find it of interest. So, um, off we go. So, allegedly, the, the myth of the founding of Yale is that it was founded in 1701 with a gift of books, and this incident is depicted um, on one of the bas reliefs in the Sterling Memorial Library name. If you walk in the front door and look up to your right, you'll see this very uh, bas relief showing the gentleman bringing gifts of books, and they apparently, they allegedly said, with these, I give these books to help to found a college library. And so that's kind of the myth. It's a little bit uh, more complex than that, but um, anyway. Uh, in 1743, the uh, library uh, published a catalog, and I was examining it to, to figure out, were there any items related to Arabic or Islam or anything at all? And I did find um, that there were two things. There were some books in Hebrew, but um, which doesn't surprise me, but um, there was this, the one at the top was, it's, the title means uh, Arn Oriental Languages. 
And then the second one there is on the Armenian language. And so I thought that was very interesting. It means that at that date, uh, Yale College students had access to uh, grammar books and bibliographies on the study of what they were calling grammatical languages. And um, then I found one of them, the introduction to the grammatical languages, and it has a fairly extended excerpt from uh, uh, Surah 10 in the Quran, the story of, uh, sort of, you almost the story of uh, Pharaoh chasing the Bani um, Israel into across the Red Sea and uh, Pharaoh drowning and, and becoming Muslim right before he dies. But um, in any case, so I thought it was very interesting that this book would have been available, I can say, to Yale College students who almost certainly could not read it in Arabic, but at least they would have been able to know about it and know about the text and about the tradition. And this book also includes uh, these about 50 pages of a survey of the characteristics of the Arabic language. It's not really a grammar, it's just sort of a description. Um, and a, a bibliography of important European works about the Arabic language and also important Arabic speaking authors. So that was uh, quite, that was something we could learn doing this. Um, so, and just a little picture of what Yale College looked like. So, at the time, in the mid 18th century, uh, that's Central Manhaven on the left, and Yale College was just this one little building. That was it. And the library was somewhere inside of that building. The building, of course, no longer exists. This whole corner is that corner of old campus that you probably all know very well. Um, there was a barber shop right there. So. <laughs> uh, maybe kids. And there's a map like this on display in the Beinecke right now for um, the Founders Day celebration. So if you want to examine real early maps of New Haven, there's one on display right now in the Beinecke. Not this one, but very similar to it. Um, now, I was trying to figure out um, you know, the state of knowledge and structured narrative at Yale. And I learned that Ezra Stiles was one of uh, Yale's early presidents. Uh, I knew already that he read Hebrew well. And again, as I say, this is not surprising because um, the, the training at Yale was intended to turn out ministers. That's basically what you would do. After getting a Yale degree, you'd go off and be or you'd go to theological school and you'd be ordained to be a minister. And the belief uh, amongst American Puritans was that it was very important to be able to read the Bible in Greek and Hebrew in order to really understand it. So people who were in training for the ministry became quite good at Greek and Hebrew. Um, Hebrew was offered at Yale, but it was never required. And apparently the students hated studying it. They, they were very reluctant students. But Ezra Stiles persisted, and he made the acquaintance of this gentleman, Rabbi Paragol, who came to um, uh, uh, Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island, um, oh boy, in the uh, late 18th century, obviously. And the, Rabbi Carroll was born in Hebron, and he was, a, he was a native speaker of Arabic, and he taught Arabic to Ezra Stiles. And on the far left there is Ezra Stiles studying his Arabic. Now, those of you who read Arabic can tell his handwriting is awful. It's really <laughs> terrible. Um, but in any case, uh, like, I don't understand why the, the letters are not joined up. It's very strange. They're, they're all written with a tiny little white space in between each form of the letter. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, Ezra Stiles was able to translate Arabic into English as long as he had an English model, basically. And so with the, the English end result, he could look at the Arabic and sort of reverse engineer what it was saying. And so that was the extent of his Arabic knowledge. And then also this portrait of Ezra Stiles that's in the Yale University Art Gallery on display right now, um, it has various attributes of him as a scholar, including, of course, a shelf of books to indicate his you know, erudition and his great knowledge. And I noticed that this one right here, there's a little bit of Arabic on the spine. And um, I got a little help from my colleague who reads Hebrew. Um, this is actually Judeo-Arabic. It's not Arabic language. It's, it says, Mishne Ibn Naimun. Wait, what is it? Musa Ibn Naimun. Yeah, it's like, it's More uh, Nebuchim. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Jewish guide for the perplexed written by Maimonides. So um, that, I, I thought it was very interesting that Stas had this included in his portrait. Um, and I don't think anybody ever noticed this little bit of Arabic script that's there. So let me see. Um, okay, so the main person who helped to, uh, I'll return to library collections. I've talked about Arabic at Yale, and now I'll specifically address library collections. The main person responsible for building Yale's Arabic language library collections, or initiating the building of them, was this gentleman, Edward Elbert Salisbury. And um, he came to Yale in um, 1828 um, as, a, as a young student. He was only 14, that was typical. You, you went to college at the age of 14, that was normal. 
and um, so basically like a like high school actually. Um, and he did the, the usual thing. He did his four years at Yale, and then he went to theological school, and he was going to be a, a minister, but he didn't feel the call, apparently. He just didn't feel that he should go be a minister. And he got advice from um, family members and Yale mentors, uh, suggesting that maybe he should turn his talents um, to the study of Oriental languages in Europe. And that was what he had to do. There was, except for you know, the occasional visiting rabbi from Hebron, it was very difficult to study Arabic in the United States. Um, there, there were no professorships, there, there wasn't a formal study of it at all. And so um, his mentors convinced him to go to Europe, and he was a man of independent means. He was, he was uh, the nephew of the wealthiest man in America at the time, and he himself had a lot of money. Um, and uh, his mother's house is, is actually Willoughby's Coffee. That's been in Selfridge's mother's house. So, um, still there. Uh, Let's see, so this is what Yale looked like in 1830 when he would have been a sophomore. There would be pollock, trees, you know, no paving on the roads. Um, this building is long gone. This was a, a state house, and Yale College is on the left there. And obviously, it doesn't look like that has been completely replaced by um, what's now old campus. So, Southman went off to Europe to study Oriental languages, of course, that was what they were called at the time. And he started in Paris studying with the great Orientalist scholars. Uh, that were there, uh, the Baron Sylvestre de Sassy and Garcin de Sassy. Uh, unfortunately, he was only in Paris, he was only able to study with uh, de Sassy for about two months before de Sassy suddenly died, quite unexpectedly. But he persisted, he stayed in Paris and he continued his Arabic study with de Sassy. Now, when um, de Sassy died, he left behind an enormous personal collection of books related to, books and manuscripts related to the study of the non Western world the ancient and contemporary non-Western world, including, uh, gosh, I don't even remember, many thousands of manuscripts in many different languages of Middle Eastern countries. Uh, and so there was this big, it took about five years to catalog the Sassi's library, and then there was a big auction that was held in 1843. And I found this quote that is alleged, that is attributed to the Sassi, where he sort of mourns the day that it's going to come when all these precious books are going to be laid out on a table for other people to buy, and how sad that's going to make him wherever he's going to be, you know. So, but um, so in the, the the auction of 1843, um, the uh, the manuscripts were sold, and Salisbury worked with several French booksellers to purchase about 63 of them that uh, that almost all have some indication inside of them that they belonged to the Sassi. Uh, let's see. So. Um, these, I'm going to show you a couple of, of examples of uh, the items that Salisbury bought from the auction. So this one is very interesting. It, the, the text inside is Charca de Sala de Lunea, but, um, which is a bell lettre sort of thing. But the thing that makes it really interesting is on the very front flyleaf is a dedication to Jassassi from Rafael Al-Kaftawi, who of course was sent from Egypt in the, in the first walk, educational walk to study in Paris and to learn in a Western technology and ways. And so it says um, to Monsieur Baron de Sassy but from Pura Rita. And that makes this book really remarkable. It's not so much of the, the shark inside, but this little dedication on the front flyleaf. So if you guys are interested in manuscripts, it's always interesting to pay attention to the stuff that is not just the text, you know, the sort of external physical evidence of the pathways that these books have taken. Uh, this one is a very interesting copy of the Muhammad al um, which includes a Muhammad that was uh, unattested completely, the number 48, which is right here, and uh, Bilal Orkali has written about this, if you want to follow up about the um, lost Muhammad. Um, so this also came from the Sassi's uh, collection. And then um, <coughs> this is a copy of uh, Shah of uh, Khat by Zabdani. And um, this object is very interesting because it may not be apparent in this image, but um, this is actually a, a contemporary copy of this uh, manuscript. So Zosini lived in the 11th century. This thing was made in 1810. Um, and the person who made the copy of the hand is very shaky. It might have been a very elderly person who made the copy for de Sassi. But then de Sassi had it interleaved with plain pages for his annotations. So this is a sort of manufactured object that shows how um, a French Orientalist studied uh, an Arabic text in the early 19th century. 
And um, there's a couple of others that are like this, but this one is, uh, uh, is large and particularly good example. And also, it was this text that Salisbury used um, when he taught his first public lecture at Yale. So he went to Europe, he got the training, he bought the books, he came back to New Haven, and his was basically the only collection of books um, in Arabic, and he also books in Sanskrit, and um, other languages in South Asia, and Persian. Um, his would have been the only such collection in the entire United States. And um, in uh, the, the Yale College tradition, the uh, professor's addresses were printed in the course catalog, and nobody lost their doors. And so Salisbury's library was basically available to anyone at all in New Haven, anyone from Yale, anyone in New Haven who found out about it and could use them, could walk over to Salisbury's house, which was not too far away from here, and use his library. Um, let me see. So uh, in 1841, he came back with his library. Um, he was appointed the first professor of Arabic and Sanskrit language and literature in the Americas. And this appointment was unsalaried, which is a very uh, important point also to remember because, of course, um, Yale was actually very poor at the time. Um, it didn't really have the funds to just appoint professors of exotic languages like Arabic and Sanskrit. And it didn't matter to Salisbury. He wanted to do this, and he said, I don't need the money. I'm a very wealthy man, so I will do it for free. So that's basically the basis on which he worked at Yale for about 17 years. Uh, so, um, and his first public lecture was given on this topic, on the, the commentaries of the Model 5 of Zelgeny. So that's why I showed you this one for you. And then Salisbury, with his money, was also one of the uh, important and major benefactors to the construction of Yale's first purpose-built library building on campus. So this building still stands on Old Campus. Um, if you go to Old Campus, it looks like it's called Dwight Chapel now. It looks like a chapel, but it was actually built to be the college library. And that's what it looked like at the time inside when it was a library. Now they look, obviously the book stacks are all gone, and they put some very nice stained glass windows so it's much darker and so it's more, you know, contemplative inside, but once upon a time, it was filled with light and it was the library. And so, and uh, Salisbury was recognized by the college as being one of its major benefactors. So, um, let me see. So in 1870, he, he left Yale in 18, he left teaching in 1856, but he remained in New Haven. He served on many Yale committees after that. Um, and in 1870, he decided, he, he, a, he had a, some kind of crisis in his life. Um, and he decided he was going to leave this all behind, leave Oriental Studies behind. And he donated 4,500 volumes, or actually I should back 4,500 somethings. I don't know if they were titles or volumes. I still don't know. Um, but they always say 4,500 titles or items you know, in various reports. I'm not really sure what exactly they meant by that. But in any case, it was a massive personal collection, again, and it was donated to the Yale College in order to establish what was to be called Salisbury's Oriental Library within the library building. And if you go into the stacks, well, fewer and fewer now because they're being sent to storage, you can still find uh, items that have the top is his personal book plate, and then when he made the donation in 1870, um, the library's book plate was the book plate, the conjunct the book plate. Um, he specified when he made the donation that the, his personal plates were supposed to be removed from all the donated items. Fortunately, it seems somebody either didn't listen or forgot or just thought it wasn't that important. So they're still there in most cases. And the gift, uh, he gave the books as well as funds to increase the collection. And his gift was valued, at, he, he valued it as about $28,000, historical dollars. And that would be about a half a million dollars in today's dollars. And it was had to have been one of the most valuable gifts that a US library had ever received up to that point. So, all right, so that was the big thing. And then for about 30 years, um, the uh, Yale, wait, I'll go back. The Yale uh, Library's Salisbury collection was esteemed to be the largest such collection in the States. And in 1903, the Yale professor of semantics, Charles Torrey, wrote that up to 1900, Yale could boast of the Arabic manuscripts acquired by the late Professor Salisbury, a worthy beginning, and no libraries in the land were better off. So at that point in 19, 1900, uh, Princeton actually surpassed Yale in terms of collecting Arabic, uh, Islamic manuscripts. They acquired a very large collection of manuscripts that were sold to them by Brill, the publisher in um, Leiden in Amsterdam. 
Uh, and uh, Charles Torrey, who I just mentioned, he assumed that the reason that Princeton was in a rush to get these manuscripts was because they wanted to beat Yale. Uh, and had a bigger collection, but you know, it's like this sort of rat race going on. Uh, the continual game of one upmanship by the venerable East Coast universities was scored by Torrey as an overall victory for the United States, which by these twin acquisitions amounting to over 2,000 manuscripts in total would ensure that this country's importance in the field of Semitic studies. So in 1900, an opportunity to build on it came when the collection of Carla Landberg came onto the market in Germany. So Landberg was a prominent Swedish Orientalist who had a particular interest in Arabic dialects. And his collection of about 800 items came to the university as a gift from American banker and philanthropist Morris Captain Jessup after the collection was put on sale in Germany shortly after Landberg's 75th birthday. So it was put on sale, Jessup bought it, and then gave it to Yale. And that's a very common thing to happen with collections. And Landberg, again, similarly to Salisbury, was wealthy enough to direct the course of his own life, and he spent decades living in Arabic-speaking countries and recording local dialects and customs. So I have a few examples of the Landberg manuscripts. So this very nice, this is a 1655 copy of, uh, it's actually a unique text, I mean, a unique addition to the manuscript. The text itself is not found anywhere else. Um, so it's about what people say about the sources of the Nile. And this is a very schematic, as you can tell, map of the Nile. And at the top, uh, it says, uh, yeah, it says, uh, the, the mountains of the moon, which is where, which, where the origin of the Nile was supposed to be. And then we have another one. Oh, this is a very interesting object. Um, so this is Rasat al Mahdi. It's the Mahdi, the famous one, Gordon Mahdi. Um, so these are copies of letters, so on the left, copies of letters sent by the Mahdi to various recipients. So shown here is the beginning of an undated letter sent to General Gordon inviting him to embrace Islam. And it begins by saying, so it says right here, he hears Muhammad al Gordon Basha. And then it goes on and it says, uh, we hereby inform you that God in his patience and generosity is long suffering, but he does not neglect and he does not turn aside his rock from the guilty people. And towards the end of the letter it includes this crucial phrase, if on our arrival we find you a Muslim, then all will be well. But if not, then God will accomplish what is decreed. So how did this copy of letters from the Mahdi end up in Lambert's hands? Nobody knows. All we know is that we got it from him. And then the letter on the right is um, from uh, Tory to Dr. Nimoy, who was um, one of the librarians uh, responsible for the Arabic and Islamic collections uh, here at Yale. And he indicates, uh, he says, I was very interested in its fresh appearance, but was not surprised. It was a highly important volume containing only copies of miscellaneous Mahdi correspondence. Um, so the letter to Gordon, for example, was of course not the letter actually sent. They're like uh, clerical secretary's copies of the letter sent out by the Mahdi. The numerous copies, blah, blah, let's see, there is no obvious reason why the volume should have been injured in battle. So apparently the legend associated with this object was that it was seized at the, the Battle of Koshki. Um, there's another copy of these, uh, another volume of Mahdi letter copies in Egypt. Uh, so, okay, next to be added to Yale's collections of Islamic manuscripts was the Welcome Krauss collection, consisting of about 370 items purchased in 1949 from the renowned antiquarian book dealer Hans Krauss of New York. Um, and Welcome, of course, some of you may have heard of Welcome Library in London, it's a famous medical library. Um, again, there's so much that is not just not known about provenance of some of these things. Nobody knows. Even the Welcome Library people, I've asked them, did you guys sell some manuscripts, you know, in the, in the mid, in the 40s? And they sort of scratch their heads. We don't know. So um, I don't know why it's got a reference to the Welcome Collection in the name of that, but the Krauss is coming from the man who sold them to us. So that's the tracing of the uh, provenance there. So the bulk of that collection is in Arabic and there's a little bit of Persian as well. And the Welcome Cross has some very unusual items, um, including this. This is um, a rather handsome leather bag, contains a large Quran written in a Maghrebi style script that was looted by the British troops after the massacre at Benin. And it's covered in blood. It's still, it's dry. When you take it out, I mean, if I had known, I wouldn't have opened it up, but uh, I opened it up and then I found a little note that this object is covered in human blood. So um, anyway, you can look at it too, uh, if you want to. 
Um, and this is not the only trophy of colonialist war that is in our collections. Um, I, I, I'm sure there are others in other parts of the collection, but for example, in the Islamic manuscripts, there's another partial Quran that was looted after the 1898 British operations in the Punjab. So there's a lot of this kind of war trophy stuff in the collection. Um, and now this is a very beautiful copy. Oops, let me see. It's the Latin Khairat. Um, this is a very beautiful African version of the Dalai al-Khayrat. So the Dalai al-Khayrat was uh, composed by the Jazuli. He was born in Morocco. It's a collection of praise, poems, and prayers, and uh, uh, the names of the beautiful names of Muhammad, and all sorts of, of nice things to say and think about the Prophet in order to gain blessings for yourself and bless the Prophet. And it's decorated in a, this really dynamically beautiful style throughout. I mean, I, have, I always have a hard time when I look at this object, which opening I want to show people because it's really beautiful. Um, so let me see. Oh, and then uh, some Persian items in that collection, so I think about Arabic, but of course Persian uh, stuff goes along with it. So we have several copies of the Hamza of Nizomni, and this is one that came from the, um, uh, the, the Welcome Crafts collection, and this shows the episode of the Red Chamber, which is also the basis for the story of the opera of Turandot, which, and the short story that Turandot is based on. So. Uh, Right. Okay, now we're going on to another gentleman from whom we got stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so Oscar Rescher was born in Germany, but in 1928 made Istanbul his permanent home. He converted to Islam and he held a number of academic posts at various libraries and universities there. He was said to have lived in a house on the Bosphorus that he shared with many cats. <laughs> His license to teach in Germany was revoked by the Nazis in 1933. Now, nobody says this. I, I think he was Jewish, but it doesn't say that so explicitly in any biographical information I've found about him. But I, I'm not sure why else that would happen to him, but um, in any case, so his license to teach was revoked by the Nazis, and in 1937, he became a Turkish citizen. Yale had purchased items from his collection on a piecemeal basis throughout the 60s, and in 1972, after his death, the Bayani purchased a group of over 200 items. These were described by Leon Nimoy in the Yale University Library Gazette as not a dealer's but a scholar's collection. I always want to emphasize this is scholarly value. This isn't just pretty, you know, manuscript. Um, it was brought together not with a view toward eventual profitable sale, but with a scholar's expert knowledge of the field. Nimoy noted the relative difficulty at the time for any Western library to build collections in Near Eastern manuscripts, and it got more and more difficult. So it would be pretty much impossible now. Um, but at the time, he said it was that the ability to build such collections was owed to the recent upsurge. I'm sorry, the, the reason it was being more difficult to acquire these things was owed to the recent upsurge in nationalism in the Near East, with its concomitant growth of solicitude for native cultural and antiquarian treasures. And that's exactly what, one of the reasons why, of course, we would be very, very careful about provenance buying things now, um, much more than we would have been back then. So the uh, Resher items are principally in Arabic, but there's a few manuscripts in Persian and Turkish, and the topical coverage is broad, so there's no thematic, uh, nothing unifying them uh, thematically. And a number of them are in very fragile condition. They're very, very poor condition. So amongst the Resher items include this uh, 13th century Quran copy. So the page on the right was added later, but the page on the left is the original 13th century from the original opening of the, the Fatah on that side, the beginning of the cow. Um, and this one was previously owned by the 32nd Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, uh, 18th Sultan Abdul Aziz. Uh, another one from Resher. Uh, let's see, this is an educational text, um, the 18th century copy. Uh, let me see, this is Kitab Qued Quran. This is uh, Ottoman Turkish, I think. Uh, yes, on the rules for oral recitation of the Quran. Uh, right, and then. Um, the last significant addition to our collection was made in 2005 by my predecessor. So the Hartford Seminary had a very large collection of Islamic manuscripts that they had also built up in the early 20th century. Again, like Yale, with the help of uh, various vendors and dealers and personal collectors. So um, in 2005, the Beinecke uh, purchased the Arabic manuscript collection of, of the seminary. And um, this gentleman, Duncan Black MacDonald, was the one who basically sent people out into uh, Lebanon and, and Egypt in order to seek out manuscripts to bring back for Hartford Seminary. 
Um, he was an expert in the Arabian Nights, and he helped to make the Hartford Seminary a center for Arabic studies in the early 20th century. So they are kind of downsizing now. Um, they are not a center for Arabic studies any longer. Um, the Hartford collection grew through additions from faculty and congregationalist missionaries traveling abroad. McDonald also had the assistance of uh, an Armenian emigre, Marius Harutian Ananikian, who was assistant, assistant librarian at the seminary, um, who acquired about 1,200 manuscripts uh, for Hartford. So when this collection was acquired, that pushed Yale into the third, into third place in the United States on manuscript rates. So um, we're number three. Uh, next is UCLA, and number one is Princeton. Of course, Princeton has 30,000 some odd manuscripts. And the Hartford collection is noteworthy for its theological manuscripts and very beautiful illuminated Qurans. Now, that's a picture is kind of washed out. Um, so, this one is, is one of the most beautiful ones. It's entirely gold. This whole thing is all gold. Um, and there's quite a few beautiful Qurans in that collection. And it makes sense that the seminary would have beautiful Qurans um, in their collection. And a couple of other things. Um, if you have a little by the so this is a 15th century copy. Um, this is a reproduction of Muhammad al Hariri, and I put it in here because I thought my colleague, who's the Chinese studies librarian, was going to attend, so because it, this one was actually made in China, and it has this uh, Chinese, uh, on, the, on the end paper, the dedication in Chinese, so. Um, and let's see, I think, no, not this page. Um, some of the pages have a uh, little interlinear commentary in Chinese as well, but this particular page doesn't have it. Okay, so where are we now? So um, let's see. Um, after that, uh, so of course we are continuing to collect, um, and the the main uh, avenue that has facilitated library collections in the 20th century has been what's called the PL 480 program. This was a, a books for wheat for books exchange sort of uh, idea. Um, and it's, it's much more complicated than I have time to explain, but basically one of the things that happened in the mid, in the, after the end of World War II, there was of course concern uh, amongst uh, various Western nations that various developing nations might be open to influences from you know, the Soviet Union, for heaven's sake, and um, so in order to basically buy their allegiance, the uh, United States and the European countries sent food aid to these countries. Um, and then, um, in exchange, the country sent back books, publications by weight. So, like, if the U.S. sent 10 tons of wheat to India, then India sent back 10 tons of books. And this actually was a really fortunate uh, deal, because this enabled U.S. libraries to build large collections in understudied languages, what, you know, of course, the U.S. State Department considers strategic languages. Um, to build these collections very cheaply and very quickly in the, in the 1960s. Now, the, the program changed after that period, and, and it evolved into a regular, um, you know, you send money to the Library of Congress, and Library of Congress will help get you books from these various places. And the Library of Congress has field offices, uh, I don't remember all of them, there's uh, Nairobi, uh, New Delhi, Cairo, um, Rio de Janeiro, and Jakarta, I think that there's five of them. Um, and, so Yale was one of the earliest participants in this program. We were library number 22. And uh, every year, the Library of Congress would say, OK, this is what it's going to cost you uh, for us to supply books from Egypt, for, or from the Middle East, for example, um, in you know, Celestial Topics. And then we would say, OK, send books in these topics and not these topics. Send all the books published in this topic, or send only a few collected books published in this topic. That kind of arrangement was spelled out in great detail. And then uh, that's basically how places like Yale, places like UT Austin, places like Princeton, all of the big research libraries that have deep collections in the Middle East study, that's, the, that's how those collections were built, was through this program. Now, as time went on, acquisition has become easier, and the various book dealers have become more savvy. And now I, I work directly with dealers that are located in Cairo and in Istanbul and in Tehran and in Beirut, and uh, because they uh, have learned what we as a large US uh, re research institution need in terms of business practices. And so I'm able to work directly with people that are based over there. Um, and 
and then there's one of these things. If you can, let's see, can we get a live? I want to get a, how do I get out of this? Um, yeah. Yeah. Like this. One other thing I want to show you before I turn over to the camera. Okay, so I just want to do a, a web page. Do do <laughs> Never mind, I'll just tell you. <laughs> you have it? Okay. So, uh, among the. Uh, oh, there we are. That looks like it. When you get in, would you just Google. Um, oh, what, what, that's it. That's very good. <laughs> what a fortunate coincidence. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show you as a very important project that my, my predecessor embarked upon um, in about 2005, which was the first uh, effort to bring full text Arabic, like Arabic script scholarly journals uh, to the web. And they uh, principally used Yale collections in order to build the, 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 the documentation that's inside. If you just click where it says search or browse, so you go in, this is part of um, Yale Digital Collections. And um, let me see, I think uh, I think you can just browse, but actually, let's see. Oh, this is the whole darn thing. Well, let's see, do a uh, repository. Let's see, do projects over here. No, I'm sorry, what to say, the digital collection. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, view collection. I go in, is it, it takes me straight. Uh, I know what you want. Yeah. Yeah, if it's. Uh, I promise, this is really awesome. <laughs> it takes me into the whole. That's not supposed to happen. It's supposed to go straight to Emil. All right, well, okay, I'll, I'll take it off with them later on to fix it. Well, let's pretend you got in, and you may be able to get in if you've got your laptop stuff now. Um, as I say, it brings, a, there's about a dozen or 14 titles of uh, mostly Arabic language scholarly journals, including a large number of titles from, published in Iraq um, that were fully digitized and are fully text searchable in Arabic script. So it was a fabulous project that was partially funded by NEH and a couple of other funding sources and brought to you by Yale. So, um, when you get a chance to give it a try, so and I'll stop there. So I can take questions after. So. All right, thank you very much. which was destroyed in uh, late uh, 2016 by airstrikes by the International Coalition and the uh, so-called Islamic State. But this is not the end of the story. When we knew about this ladder, which was built in the 60s, it was built by the Chinese, a giant story. And they built something like a basement where like, they have this uh, Story and this experience with uh, earthquakes, etc. So they built something in the basement that no fire, nothing can touch it. We were lucky that before the uh, fall of Mosul by ISIS in 2013, they moved all the rock and private collections to the basement and they left it there for some maintenance in the building. And then the library was destroyed. Everyone says the library is destroyed, we will not find anything. But then we decided to... And this is how the library looked like yeah. after the destruction. But then we decided to launch a campaign to preserve whatever we can. And then, and then we did it. And this is how the library also looked like from inside. And this is what we found. We found all the Ottoman records, 
many uh, manuscripts. This is how the books now. We got donations. And this is the team. This is the kind of manuscripts we found. We, we, we figured out that we have Persian manuscripts in the library. We didn't know that we have them. We have many other Arabic and Islamic collections. We have one of the oldest Qur'ans. One of the, it uh, comes from the Umayyad history, uh, Umayyad period. And then we started and continued. Look, this is how the library looked like in May 16, 2017. You see here. And this is how we did after like almost one year in February. Uh, all of these efforts to rebuild the library was just started with a tweet online. We say, um, you see, you can follow up the story uh, online. You will see all the details here. Everything started with a small, like a short tweet. I said, our library was destroyed, we need your help. After I tweeted this, many people started sending books. In less than five months, we received 60,000 books. And now the library is, it's not the same building, but we opened a new library. This is how my laptop is. Sorry. This is, I think it's clear if you can see it now. This is how the library looked like before, and this is how it's now. 60,000 books. We are waiting for more than 100,000 books from Germany, uh, about 30,000 from uh, many European countries, and the books we re reserved were like almost 32,000, but all of them were private collections. What we are doing now in order to rebuild the library is that we figured out also, we found out that there are many families who hold private collections, books no, nobody hears of them, manuscripts never been seen. And those people have decided to contribute and to donate their books to the library. So one of the professors who have more than 100,000 books, half of their manuscripts, he decided to donate them to the uh, central library. During our effort to uh, to rebuild this library, there was a decision, decision made by the governor of the city to take another building, which is another library. It's called the public library, where we have the journals, the records, public records, uh, newspapers. He decided to use it as a court for uh, ISIS funds. So it's again using Twitter. We tweeted something to the Prime Minister of Iraq. We say, what, if, if you decide to take over the building, you will be also, uh, you do what ISIS did. So what makes you better than ISIS? So he responded directly to the tweet and he decided to keep the building and also to support the building. Now we have digitized more than like, I, I think it's now 70% of the uh, newspapers. Most of these newspapers, like from the, uh, 18th century, we have them now, and we have some people who were working in the old city of Mosul. They were trying to uh, renovate some some houses, and like by accident, they found a huge collection of Ottoman records. These Ottoman records is called Tapu. It's the um, simply the, the records of the whole city. Everyone has a house, old house. We find his records there. We found them. We moved them to another building, but the record disappeared. And they are now, I don't know how they were moved to Turkey. They are in the uh, National uh, Archive in Turkey. Yes, they were moved, removed from Mosul. Um, I'm talking about the library of Mosul, and she talked about the Arabic collection. It's, we are organizing this event is to see how we will connect the two libraries, and how we can let Yale University and its library contribute to this event, to this uh, university. And this is how uh, uh, Robin is going to explain. <laughs> we will explain the digital collections and how we can use them, how, how, we, how we can make all these collections. Like the Arabic uh, collections uh, immigrated from Middle East to Yale University. Now we need them. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
our digital, and then I'll stand up again so everybody can see me. Um, our digital collections were created over a period of time as the technology to do so has developed. So you will find some very low resolution images, but it wasn't done in order to make it easy for people. It was done because that was, at the time, when those images were uploaded to the web, the idea was to optimize for the web. That was you know, in the early days of the web, in the mid-90s. Um, and now that the idea of a digital archive with high resolution images has become, it's much more widespread. Many of the recently digitized images from Bionicke collections, for example, come in very high, big file sizes, but offer multiple sizes to download. But just looking at the image still requires some bandwidth. So um, even at home, my house, some, sometimes it just depends. I sometimes have trouble using it just because um, bandwidth is you know, finite. And I would pay for the high, high speed, so I don't know about the situation in Mosul. Yeah, um, the, the internet is not that good in the city, but they have access to the internet. And the digital collection is so important for, like, for two reasons. First, we want to convince the people to, because we still have families who refuse to, to digitize their collection. They are still afraid of, like, why would we digitize them? Why would we make them public? We need to bring this uh, digital culture to the city so we can digitize all the documents there. The best way to preserve it, because we can't make sure what will happen after 10 years, but if, if there is no uh, crazy uh, man will occupy the city, at least there will be some, like, the nature would, 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 would do something. So we want to, to digitize all the papers we have. So bringing digital collections would help. And it will make it easier for the students to get access out of the like university because the university still have this problem problem of bureaucracy it, now in order to get into the university you are not allowed to get a laptop with you inside yeah you can't take your laptop inside the university and in order to get into the library you will need many like bureaucratic process so it's very difficult for, for them and something also there was kind of like a digital collection jstor and some other collections but uh, the government of Iraq didn't pay uh, their, the money they were like owing more than two million dollars they didn't pay and they closed uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, that's almost a very important point um, a lot of the, the stuff that you have access to while you're a student here at Yale um, it's produced by commercial entities and um, these things are very expensive now JSTOR is a non-profit but um, it also costs money to run even on problems. So yeah, <laughs> now, I'm, a little bit, I'm a little bit surprised that they don't have like some kind of a sliding scale. Um, many places will do that. Many uh, producers of this kind of uh, of these kinds of digital projects will have you know, one price if you're in the U.S., a different tier if you're in Europe, and then another tier if you're elsewhere. Um, so I'm surprised that JSTOR isn't offering that kind of a model for Iraq. But um, so. It, it's it, you may have you may be familiar with the debate about open access scholarship and open access journal publishing and the reasons for it, um, principally being that in the sciences in particular, journals are very expensive to subscribe to, and um, so it can be so. So if a, a, a researcher does scientific research that's funded with public money, and then publishes in this journal that is so expensive to get access to. It means that something that you know your and my tax dollars have paid for is now inaccessible to us because it's only offered through a very expensive platform. This is very much true in the sciences. It's less true for disciplines uh, like history and social sciences, um, but the hard sciences definitely suffer from this. But still, um, a lot of these databases are very expensive and they don't necessarily offer uh, tiers of pricing to uh, foreign countries, to non-Western countries, basically, that really could benefit from it. But occasionally, there, there are deals made. Yeah, I just wanted to bring this to your attention. This is a very important uh, digital collection. Um, like about 60 or 60, 65 uh, of their collections are, were brought from uh, all the charts and monasteries in the Middle East. They were digitized and they were put online. You can find uh, if you are interested in history, religion, anything related to Middle East, Arabic language, Hebrew, 
say I you will find it in this uh, uh, collection. It's from the Arabic uh, Islam, like the 17th century. They also have the uh, uh, Bible from the 6th century. This is from Karakosh Museum. There are quite good uh, uh, digital collections, but the problem in, in, in countries like Iraq, the digital culture is still new. We want to do something to introduce the, this culture to them, to convince the authority that digitizing all the documents is important. Uh, we are also like, we were lucky that part of the Iraqi National Museum was digitized, but there are still like other uh, organizations struggling with the authorities to get the permission to digitize things. Yeah. Can you cover some Arabic collections online. Yeah. Yeah. Are you are you to do the campus? Online. Online. Collections. Oh, wow. That's it. Yeah. yeah I know. Okay. So this is another project. Um, this is, uh, let's see, if you scroll to the bottom, I think you'll see the partner library all the way to the bottom. Yeah, okay, so these are the partner libraries. Um, so uh, a couple of, of universities located in Middle Eastern countries and a couple of US major research institutions have partnered to produce this collection. And if you could go back up again, please, Omar. Um, and it's nice because it is bilingual, it's in Arabic and in English, and this offers uh, almost 10,000 volumes. It's constantly growing, uh, and this is completely free. Um, so this is something that you know, if people are willing to use, a, to engage with a digital environment, um, this is a way of giving back to countries over there. Um, and let's see, yeah, you go in. It's so like the scholarly of the Nazis. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's, yeah, and you can actually page through. If you go to the, oh, I'm curious here, there's like a double, that, that's like an opening. And it moves a little faster. It's, it gives you the opening, and then um, you can move through the book. Now, they are not full text searchable. Only the metadata is searchable. So that means this descriptive information here you can search in Arabic script or in transliteration, but you can't search on words inside the text. So, but it, it's that, that's because OCR for Arabic is very difficult. Can you download the images? Yeah, you can. Um, let me see. Somewhere there's little tools. You can you can download the book. Uh, the only thing you can do is to take screenshots. I think. There. Um, not all the books are. Yeah. I think maybe not. No, you can download high yeah. resolution and there high resolution. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And um, one of my Iraqi friends was telling me he was looking at this resource and, and he said there are books in this collection that were banned in Iraq that he's never been able to read. And now um, he's able to get access to them. Yeah. So, so, you know, and there are other projects to offer digital uh, Middle East content to the world. Um, there are a number of them, and they are very expensive to keep going. And sometimes they start with a big rush of enthusiasm, and then they're kind of hard to maintain and to maintain the uh, enthusiasm. But um, there, it's definitely better than it was even 10 years ago in that sense, in terms of being able to get access to digital content in the Arabic language. Yeah, this is also another uh, important resource. Uh, like oh yeah, Arab this is the uh, Arab yeah. literature. Um, this is done by uh, Marshall Lynx Kuali, and she is an amazing blogger. She reads voraciously in Arabic literature, and she blogs about it all the time. And uh, and I think there's other contributors in addition to her. Yeah. Um, but this person is just astounding in her ability to uh, create informed uh, writing about Arabic language literature. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Where, where 
did you find out about this wheat for books exchanges? If you do PL four eighty, this uh, this thing uh, yeah. order PL four eighty. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. If, yeah. If you do uh, libraries, uh, history of libraries and PL four eighty, you find some very interesting writing about the the project. So, but yeah, and in fact, when you check books out uh, from the library that were published in about the sixties and seventies. Um, I meant to get a picture of this, but I didn't have time in the end. A lot of times you'll see stamped inside the front, inside the front cover of the book, it'll say provided by the PL480 program. And that's what that means, is that the book came to the library through this project. Yeah. It, it, was, it was pretty cool, neat, you know, the, the way to bulk up library programs quickly. There's a great book that's been published recently called Hungry World, and it's about America's Cold War strategy in Asia, mm -hmm. which is all about increasing agricultural yields. Right. And that aspect of this mm -hmm. massive sort of Cold War strategy was never even mentioned. Before. A lot of it only talks about the food yeah. for aid, the, the food for aid uh, side of it and doesn't talk about the side of it that has to do with library collections. But the Library of Congress has uh, some interesting pages on that aspect of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it's really neat. Any other comments or questions for us? Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> uh, some people have already seen it. Uh, Mozilla AI is working in the uh, since yesterday to launch an initiative, Mugaba Aina Mosel, Yale loves Mosel hashtag. Uh, mm -hmm. You can follow on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. It's just starting, but we hope to leave it as an open concept for as many faculties, institutes, students to link up with Mosul in a variety of ways, whether it's through arts, through science, through um, library projects, uh, sharing collections, classrooms. So uh, think as widely and as creatively as you can. Uh, if you lived in a, in a city that was basically isolated and completely closed as a prison for three years, mm -hmm. what you'd want to do? <laughs> and, and throw it back uh, at, at us on the hashtag uh, and we will start to retweet and our colleagues in Mosul will know. Yeah, about 100 students will contribute to this. Is it L O V E S or is it like L U V E S? L O V E S. Okay. Without the hard. Oh, yeah, yeah. With the New York shirts. Yeah. 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 Yeah.